Hello and welcome to the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. Each episode will bring you the latest news from the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, as well as fascinating interviews with entertainment personalities, government leaders, and community advocates. St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, where Scotland meets the City of Angels. Let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome to another great episode of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles' podcast. I have the absolute pleasure today to be sitting here talking with the chairman of Visit Scotland, the National Tourist Board for Scotland, Lord Thursa. And our moderator today is the past president of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles from 2014 to 2020, Mr. Ian scone Reese. Thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure. Good afternoon. So I know that Ian has a ton of great questions for you regarding Scotland, visiting Scotland and and tourism. And I would love to just jump right into it and get started. Well, I will will do that, Joe. I'll I'll kick it off. And and I would like to mention to Lord Thurso that prior to um, your coming online here, uh, Joe and I were having a very interesting conversation and I learned for the first time that she's visited Scotland and um, I, I hope she's going to, to mention a few of her experiences as we, as we go on. But anyway, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us on this Friday, early Friday evening from, from Thurso. It's very much appreciated. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for the wonderful um, videotaped recognition of our, of our 90th anniversary, um, especially the closing sequence where, uh, <laughs> where you offered us good health with a, with a, with a dram. And um, yeah. we may see a little bit more of that later on. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I must just tell you, it was great fun to do that. And I thought just doing a head and shoulders sitting in my office would be a bit boring. So I enlisted my wife's help. And what you don't see, obviously, on the video is how the devil do I manage to get a glass when I'm walking towards a sundial in the garden? So I had my wife just out of camera holding the glass. And as I went up, I reached forward. She was going, here it is. So it was a pleasure to do that. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. and I'm so glad it was well received. Well, I'm glad you could rely on your wife to do that. If I'd had my wife doing it, when she handed me the glass, it would have been empty. <laughs> you might say that I couldn't possibly call it <laughs> uh, House of Cards. Okay. <laughs> well, in preparation to talking with you today, um, obviously I, I, I did a little bit of um, research, and I, w- I was very interested to discover that um, you started your, your career in the hospitality trade, and um, I would think that that experience makes you one of the the best qualified chairman of, of Visit Scotland um, in, in recent memory. But I, I wonder, has that experience in the hospitality trade helped you in your current position? Oh, absolutely. Um, in two ways. First of all, having been a hotelier, um, I, I kicked off by with training with the Savoy in London and did the old fashioned management training, which was that they stuck you in the, the, the deep end. And if you were still swimming around a few years later, they gave you a job. But it was a year in the kitchens and six months in the bar and six months as a waiter. And one of the fun things I remember doing was actually going to the old Smithfield market to buy the meat, you know, getting up at three in the morning, all that. And the old Covent Garden. I actually worked there just before it closed. But you've got a real feel for how the industry works. And then I was extremely lucky. I ended up reception manager at Claridge's and then got sent by the chairman to be the general manager of the Lancaster Hotel in Paris. So there I was, age 27, running a luxury hotel in Paris. Um, and that was just an amazing start to a career. And from there, I managed to work in some really very interesting properties. And all of that um, was useful. I then started uh, a business from scratch, which was a tremendous experience to have. And then I went to running companies. Um, And so all of those experiences were the experiences that the the industry has in Scotland. And so you you understand them. Uh, Here at home in Caithness, 
for many years, um, I had a small hotel um, that went welcomed shooting and fishing guests. And so I knew what it was like to operate in Scotland as a small business. And through all of that, I also got to know lots of people in the industry. So I was known. So the two advantages I think I had was one, that I knew how the industry worked and I was a professional in the industry. But two, I knew most of the players in the industry already. So I didn't have to go around introducing myself. I could go around and say, this is what I want to do. And I think that was a huge help at the start. From the beginning, um, was the hospitality industry something that you always wanted to to be a part of? Well, yes and no. I mean, I often have described my life as one long accident um, in that uh, I keep doing things. But, I know, I, you know, if, I'd, if I'm one of those people who... Uh, you know, at school or university and sat down and written the list of this is what I will do and this is what I will do and in that year I'll become Prime Minister or whatever. Uh, none of the things I might have written down um, uh, have come to pass and a whole lot of things have happened that I would never have dreamt of. And uh, I became, I got into the industry, I was at school, I was at a very good boarding school and they just invented the idea of a careers master. This was quite new thought in those days. And he had to see us all, so in I went. And um, I didn't really want to go to university. I felt I'd been educated sufficiently. Um, I, uh, all of which is incredibly arrogant looking back, but uh, at the time it seemed like a good idea. Um, I didn't want to go in the army where a lot of people were going. Um, and the city, I thought, was lots of people with quill pens and big ledgers, so I didn't feel like doing that. So he rather exactly, well, what do you want to do? He said, what do you do in the holidays? I said, well, last holidays, I worked as a washer up in a small hotel in Caithness. He said, are you interested in the hotel business? And I I couldn't think of a reason for saying no. So he gave me a form, which was the application for a scholarship to the Savoy, which I did and went in. And within a short space of time, I fell totally in love with the industry. It, uh, I, I love people. I love motivating people. I love getting teams going. And you couldn't be in a better industry if that is your passion. And it's a passion I've developed through everything I've done. So it was an accident, but it was an accident that clearly was meant to happen. Well, um, I, I have never personally been involved in the hospitality industry, but I've taken advantage of, um, of hotels and restaurants and so forth, though, of course. And it seems to me that it must be a tremendously demanding um, industry, um, ha- having to be, you know, <laughs> on on your best behaviour at all times, and, and and meeting people and greeting people and making them feel comfortable. Um, it, it's it's probably not something that I would be able to do. But <laughs> is it? demanding did you find that demanding oh yes i mean uh, it's a demanding industry because you don't go home till the clients have gone home as it were and when you when you start off in the industry one of the advantages is that there is no pending tray i mean you've either dealt with it or it was the, it was yesterday's problem and that was that you move on um but equally that gives you which is that's nice because actually each day is a fresh day which is kind of fun but also the satisfaction that you is derived from looking after somebody and doing it well. Um, you know, whether you're the restaurant manager or the reception manager or whatever it might be, and the client has a problem. I think every problem, every complaint is actually an opportunity to get a satisfied customer. Every time somebody said to me, I, you've done this badly or, the, you know, I haven't been looked after properly, I see that as somebody who's righteously cheesed off. And if I can put it right, they become a good customer because what people like most of all is having things fixed for them. So there's huge degrees of satisfaction in it. And I I must say the times I was saddest was when I would go home from work knowing that I actually hadn't satisfied a customer. So great pleasure, but occasionally not so great pleasure. But it, it and then obviously when you move up to running companies and businesses you get all the problems of a business and you get a huge pending tray and uh, all the rest of it but actually on the shop floor it's one of the most satisfying things you can do i i, I can imagine that it that it must be 
I, mu I must comment on, on your comment about not wanting to go into the city and pushing a quill pen, because that, that's how I started my, my life in Manchester, uh, being, being an article clerk to a firm of chartered accountants. <laughs> and, uh, well, I tell you now, um, A, I think I would have probably greatly enjoyed a stint in the armed forces, um, from what I now know. Uh, B, I think I would have very much enjoyed many aspects of, of, of city life. And indeed, um, during my time in the House of Commons, sat on the Treasury Select Committee and was one of the parliamentary commissioners of banking standards. So uh, what I thought then, and that's what I felt then, but it's not a reflection of what I think now. Because you, you mentioned that, um, you know, you, you, you met your, your career um, master at, at Eton, I presume. Yeah. And um, he he was asking you these questions about, um, you know, what industry would you would you like like to go into? Um, you were a member of parliament for a, a period of time. Um, did you ever have any aspirations of, uh, of leading the country? Um, it would probably be a lie if I was to say that I never thought about the possibilities because everybody who becomes a member of parliament at some point thinks, well, I could do that better than the incumbent. Um, but uh, I was always very realistic. That was, this was another great accident in my life that came about firstly because my, in 1995, my father died um, quite young. He was only 72. Uh, and as a result, I inherited the title and that gave me a seat in the House of Lords. And I had never thought of politics, but I happened to be running a company which was quite close to London. And I was able to go into the House of Lords and I found I quite enjoyed it. And uh, in those days, the, the, there weren't a lot of younger uh, people in my party. Uh, and uh, so I used to get asked to speak quite often and I got more and more into it. And we then reformed the House of Lords and the hereditaries left, with one exception. Uh, and so I was sort of being sounded out about, would you like to become a life peer and stay in? Uh, when the MP for this part of the world, who was a good friend, said to me, look, don't tell anybody, but I'm actually going to stand down at the next election in 2001, and I think you should try and be elected. Up to that point, it had never occurred to me. And I wouldn't have stood for any other constituency. Um, this is my home constituency. Um, this is where my grandfather had been the MP. Uh, and uh, it enabled me to move back home, uh, which I wanted to do and live here. Uh, but it also, I was realistic that, that in my small third party that we were, there's almost no likelihood of any form of ministerial career but I felt I really could do something in this area to help the area, um, particularly on the business front, um, where I could work with companies to get more jobs and so on. And that, that's what I did. It came as a complete shock to me when uh, in 2010, we ended up in the coalition government and many of my colleagues became ministers. Um, I chose not to be a minister, but preferred to do the select committee work and chaired uh, I chaired a committee in, in, in the House of Commons and did some other stuff there um, and then um, ceased to be an MP in 2015 when the wise burghers of Caithness, Southern and Easteros who had elected me in 2001 uh, to their great uh, discredit decided to chuck me out and uh, so I, I, I ceased doing that and actually um, I was quite glad in a way. Nobody likes losing an election, but it meant that I could draw uh, uh, that period of my life to a close. I'm now not a member of a party. I am apolitical, which I have to be for my job. And all that allowed me to actually apply for and get the job as chairman of Visit Scotland. How is Visit Scotland, the National Tourist Board, funded? Where, where, where do you get your, 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 your money from? We are basically funded by what's called grant in aid. Um, and grant in aid is basically a government grant. Um, and all of the national tourist boards in the United Kingdom, whether it's Visit England or the British Tourist Authority or whatever, 
receiver grant. The difference since devolution in Scotland is that we receive ours from the Scottish um, government, and uh, currently it's just a little over £41 million pounds a year. So that's our core grant, and that enables us to have an administration to hire and keep people and to do the basic work. On top of that, uh, there is a small amount of commercial income that we, we get from our eye centres who uh, sell goods and services, and so there's a little bit of income comes in from that. But we also have access to specific Scottish government funds, which uh, they ask us to manage to achieve a particular objective. So there is a growth fund, for example, and uh, we can acquire money to do something with growth fund money. There are budgets for events. So part of Visit Scotland is um, event uh, the Adve events directorate, and they do all of the things like uh, the Ryder Cup, for example, last year was, was, was uh, two couple of years ago, was dealt by them. The Solheim Cup last year was dealt with by them. And we have the tagline, Scotland, the perfect stage. And so we do sporting events and we do, um, but also big arena events. We help with uh, um, all sorts of things. And then at the other end of that spectrum, of course, is our help to all the clan events that take place. So we always have a fund. So um, uh, this year should have been the five yearly um, uh, gathering of Clan Sinclair here in Caithness, which I was actually organising and responsible for. And we had Sinclairs coming from all over America and from Canada and from Australia and it all was based around the Holkirk Games, which is the last uh, Saturday in July, plug for the Holkirk Games from its chieftain. Um, but uh, uh, sadly, of course, the whole thing has been cancelled and we hope to reschedule next year. Now, within that, um, one of my co-advisors had managed to apply for and get a couple of thousand pounds from the Clam Fund, which would have helped us to do quite a lot of the things we wanted to do. So um, uh, that's another area of funding. And then we also use our expertise on behalf of the Scottish Government to do some of, uh, to help with assess applicants for investments. So for example, we have something called the Rural Infrastructure Tourism Fund, or the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund. And that is where local authorities bid for money to do infrastructure work uh, around tourism, which might be building a car park, it might be building a set of loos, it might be a you know, it all helps to you know create a better visitor experience. So our core grant in aid is what pays the salaries, gets the team going, and allows us to deliver the strategy. We operate within the program for government of the Scottish government, um, and we uh, can deliver more from various funds that they make available to us. Well, that's very interesting. You, you've touched on a, a couple of topics there that we have uh, related questions to um, later on. So I, I, I'm looking forward to you giving us a little bit more detail on those areas. Um, some years ago, um, we had the pleasure of welcoming um, one of your predecessors, uh, Mike Cantley, who came over here. And um, we were talking to him about the, the same thing about funding. And um, without putting too fine a point on it, he basically complained that he didn't have enough money. And um, there were some other organizations over here who were attracting um, uh, tourists and, and visitors um, to, to, to the United Kingdom. And uh, the complaint was, well, they, they, they have more money to work with. But from our perspective in, in Southern California, things apparently have, have, have changed um, because we see a much higher profile now um, of Scotland um, in, in our neck of the woods. And I, I, I wonder what has changed to, to, to make that so? Well, I'm, and here I must pay tribute to Mike, my predecessor, because he put in train an awful lot of the things that I think enable us to work smarter, which is what it's really about. I mean, to put the money side, I would always argue for more money, and I could always point out that we could do more for more money. Um, when I uh, was first involved in tourism politics and down in London, 
um, in the late uh, 90s, the then Department of uh, National Heritage, as it, as it was called, gave a grant in aid to visit Britain that was about 70 million, which if you grossed it up today, would be closer to 110 million or something like that. They actually currently give Visit Britain 21 million. So when I am complaining about cuts, I have to recognize that actually we are the far better off and are far better supported by our devolved Scottish government than Visit Britain and Visit England are by the Westminster government. And that's not to say one is better than the other. It's just they've got different priorities. So uh, equally, I can point out that whereas we have 41 million now, you the equivalent of what we had um, 10 years ago would be nearer to 70 million. So there's no doubt that in the years of austerity in the UK, when all government budgets were cut, we've had cuts just as much as everybody else. But what is really interesting is we, we've learnt, which was what Mike started, um, was to work smarter. Uh, and I completed with the team a, a, a programme of a completely new sort of, um, uh, platforms, uh, particularly around what they call enterprise resource management systems, which meant that actually as of about 18 months ago, we are completely virtual and in the cloud. And that has meant that we don't actually have, have nearly so many big offices. And curiously, it meant that when we went into lockdown, we left the offices and were able to go smoothly to virtual working. Yeah. Zoom, which I now do all the time, um, Teams, Cisco, all sorts of other things. And what we have learned is that actually we can, we did a wonderful little film that we put out on YouTube quite early on, which just said, and I'm sure you've seen it, it, the basic thrust of you can't come and stay with us, but here's what it's like. We remember you come when you can. And yeah. it was just a nice thing to keep everybody going. That was made by individuals locked down in their houses um, from material that we had uh, stored. So, I, I, you know, that very professional film was actually created by our in-house team in their homes. And that's what we can do now, which four years ago we simply couldn't have done. And that's uh, meant that we, we've been able to be much more creative in the way we go about uh, putting Scotland on the map. And the other was um, we, we've had some really creative people in our marketing team. We had um, uh, Charlie Smith, who, who um, really reshaped us uh, with the Scotland is now campaign, which uh, we started with Scot the Scott Spirit campaign, then Scotland is now, and currently the next iteration of that, which we're on at the moment, is only in Scotland. Um, Charlie's left us now, gone to work for Scottish Enterprise, but um, Vicky Miller, who is our our marketing director, is absolutely fantastic at doing this. So uh, we use uh, the power of the internet. We use the the um, the the new ways of doing business. And, and really that helps us to eliminate our inability to buy big and helps us to get directly through to the consumer in a way we've not been able to do. And I think at a strategic level, what um, the board have, have done and what I very much encouraged was to get us to focus on what we need to do and not do the things that we don't need to do. So, each area of Scotland, we are not the sales department for every town in Scotland. That's what they've got to do. We are the people who make Scotland available to people. We make them brand aware so that they think of coming to Scotland. And then after that, the internet largely takes over. That's, that's, that's fascinating because um, I think that a number of organisations and companies are experiencing um, a, a similar result of, the, of this pandemic. And I wonder, from, from your point of view with Visit Scotland, do you, do you think you'll ever go back to the old ways of doing things? Uh, interestingly, that is one of the things we are discussing at the moment. Um, and the answer is that what we are doing is looking at how we've worked during this pandemic. And there are clear advantages from some things. Equally, there are things we haven't been able to do we really miss. 
So I think in, in the fine old traditions of Scotland, we'll take the best of the old and the best of the new and put them together. So, uh, for example, we have learned to work from home and on Zoom and all the other tools that we have, Teams, whatever. And that has meant that we've come to realize that you don't have to go to an office or be attached to one. Well, one of the joys of that, and this is much wider than Visit Scotland, it's for Scotland as a whole. If you think of the crofting communities on the West Coast and the North Coast, actually you could have people who are in quite senior positions who lived in a crofting community, provided they've got good broadband, which a lot of them, if not all of them, do now, um, with that, you can you could actually be the director of sales and you could live in Ullapool. Um, and we can now work out that we have, say, one week in the month, which might be meetings week, and you travel down to Glasgow or Edinburgh or where you need to go in that, that week. Um, so that's one of the things that might be developed. So you might get people with higher salaries in remoter communities, and that spreads wealth into those communities, supports shops, you know, all these other good things. So that's an interesting sort of thing to look at going forward that I think we can all recruit, not necessarily of, well, if you join our company, you have to move to our town. I think that is, is really interesting uh, that we can look at that. But I think the overall, whereas before lockdown, the default position was you come into the office to work and if you've got a really good excuse, you can work from home. I think the default position going forward will be you work from home and you come into the office when you need to. Yes. The, the office will be, you can't do a creative meeting um, on an iPad. Um, you need to be in a room. You need to be bouncing off people. Uh, so there are lots of areas where you need everybody to get together. But the office, I think, will become a place you go to when you need to uh, and for particular purposes, whereas the getting the grunty stuff down will be done done at home. Um, and I think for a lot of our our people, um, there will be a change in that balance. But then there are a lot of our teams who are outward facing, go get them types who turn up at events, who go to conferences, who come over with you know lead trips of tra travel agents and all these things, or come and visit guys like you um they of course will always be doing that so the human side will always be important but with luck we'll have a little fewer but we'll have less office space less complex um kind of hard needs and those funds can go to support those people doing those those human things yes yeah, so as as you as you said um earlier you you, you know that the Obviously, the strategy is to take the best of both worlds, the best of what we're having to deal with now and um, the best of what um, we, we did in the past. I'd like Jo to step in here because I know she's visited Scotland and ask her, why, why did you go to Scotland, Jo? For me, it was an opportunity. How often are you in the area? Uh, I don't get to travel. Me, I travel with my family every two years, but... We were in Northern Ireland and it was like, hey, we can take a ferry to Scotland. And it was always something that I wanted to do. And it was like, oh, let's check this off of my travel bucket list. So we hopped the ferry and went to Scotland for the day, got off the ferry, walked around. It rained the first five minutes we were there. And then it was an absolutely gorgeous day and went in and I says, OK, we're here. We have to do something touristy and very Scottish. So I was like, we have to go have haggis. Like we have to find a place and go and eat some haggis. And we found this pub that was open and went, and as a family, we had this order of haggis and we all drank McKellen and ate haggis and hung out in a pub and listened to, we were at a port. So we listened to like fishermen tell stories and tell us jokes. And I remember the funniest part about that trip was this guy told a joke and everybody in the bar laughed and we didn't laugh because we couldn't understand the punchline. And, 
after he said it again, and he just kept saying the punchline over and over again, hoping that we would understand it. And at some point, he must have said it about five times before I just started laughing. And everybody in the bar could tell that I was laughing because I was being polite. And I didn't, I still didn't understand what he was saying, but I was just like, okay, you're not going to not let this joke go. So. I I find it difficult to believe that um, a lot of visitors go to Scotland because of the haggis. (laughs) Although although I hasten to say, and I've had this conversation with Joe, we both love haggis. Um, But once people know how haggis is made, it it, it, it frequently has an opposite effect. But the rugged beauty of of, of Scotland, um, the landscape, the scenery, the locks, um, the, the mountains. Um, is, is this a principal reason people come to Scotland? Oh, it's one of the main reasons. I mean, if you if you look at all the research that's been done on Brand Scotland, going back, you know, 20, 30, 40 years to when Brand Research sort of started, it's consistent all the way through. And it tells you that the environment is always near the top of the list. Um, the culture, history, and tradition is always near the top of the list, and the warmth of welcome that people get, the traditional highland or lowland welcome uh, that people get. And those three things are always um, near the top. So I think, I mean, people are coming for a very clear idea of what Scotland is, which is a wonderfully clean, um, beautiful landscape. I mean, whether you're down in the borders, or in Dumfries and Galloway, or whether you're up in the far north or anywhere in between, or even on the islands, you know, you've got so many different landscapes, seascapes, um, types of, of, of majestic mountains through to lovely rolling green lands. You take all of that. Um, it is a huge advantage um, for a relatively small country that could fit several times over into many American states. Um, We have a stunning variety of truly magnificent um, scenery and environments. And therefore, that is always at the top. But there's a lot, lot more than that. Well, that brings me to the next question, because um, on a, a, I I was going to say a recent tour to, to Scotland, but it wasn't recent. It was a few years ago. We were at Edinburgh Castle. And um, at the conclusion of our, of our tour, um, we were basically dressed down and admonished by our tour guide who complained that, the, uh, that Scotland is, is known for the kilts and, uh, and, and whiskey and bagpipes. And that's about it. And of course, you know, as, as many of us know, Scotland has contributed far more than that um, to, to the whole world. Uh, in fact, um, there's a book which I know you're familiar with called um, How Scotland Invented the Modern World and, and Everything in It. But do you think enough is done to, um, to communicate um, Scotland's achievements in, in the arts and science and literature? I think the first thing I would say is um, uh, uh, I am inordinately proud of our whiskey. Um, I would be because amongst other things, I'm a patron of the keepers of the quake. Um, it is a fabulous national product. Uh, when I was in uh, New Mexico a couple of years ago to a big conference, the hotel had a whiskey bar, had a gentleman from, I think he originally really from New Jersey, but who, um, uh, arrived in a kilt and told everybody about the whiskies. It, it is a fabulous promotion of Scotland to have this national product. I regularly wear the kilt. Um, I love it. Um, and I think it's a marvellous thing. And for me, the bagpipes are one of the greatest instruments in the world. Both my boys are bagpipers. And um, if you've never listened to it, listening to um, the Red Hot Chili Pipers, uh, play a mixture of rock and pipes is simply fabulous. Uh, so I start by saying I disagree with the premise of the question, which is those are pretty good things to be proud of. But absolutely, yes. I, I, I do a speech sometimes, I've done a couple of times, which is the, the journey driving down the A9 from my house here to um, 
uh, uh, at uh, an event in Glasgow, it was, and I and I described as I came down the fact that I passed the Pictish Cairns in Caithness, where the uh, Neolithic people lived, and I passed the marvellous um, Barry Castle of Dunrobin, and I passed the Spinning Dale, which was the first ever um, industrial spinning mill in Scotland, and I passed obviously Culloden uh, and all these other iconic historical places. And then I said, but I, I, when I went home, I went through um, Stirling where Stirling University is a leader in many forms of uh, technologies. Uh, I pointed out that 70% of the nail varnish worn in Europe is made in Invergordon by an American-owned company called Kirka. Um, I pointed out that 70% uh, of the cameras on the seabed in the world are made in Wick, 20 miles from here. The biggest customer is the US Navy. Um, every US naval submarine has a camera on the back of it. And I went through, and my point in doing this is this is not two Scotlands. This is one Scotland which has all that wonderful history, that has all this modern um, uh, industry and technology. And of course, if you look at the Enlightenment, that amazing period, Adam Smith and, and so many others, um, and you look at the great contribution of Scotland, there's a vast amount in the arts, science and so forth. But I take the view, it's not they are only thinking about pipes, whiskey, uh, I'm surprised he didn't put shortbread in there as well. Or, um, but that, that actually, this is a great hook to get people here. And look at all the other things we've got to talk about and show you when you get here. So who's worried? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, fabric of, uh, of, of cultural wealth that's, that Scotland has to offer. There's absolutely no question. The events that we hold here in Southern California um, are, are very well attended. Um, we, we, have a, uh, we have a Highland Games, which is normally held in October every year, which won't be held this year, um, which is our local Highland Games that the St. Andrew Society uh, supports. And over two days, we, we get between 25 and 30,000 people coming through the gates. And one of the things that they always ask is, what are the clans? What do they mean? And my name is so-and-so. Am I connected in any way with a clan in Scotland? And I wonder if you could just give us a brief uh, um, outline of, of how important the clans are today in Scotland in, a, in attracting um, visitors. Um, this, this that's a huge question, uh, and you can I could go into it in a huge number of ways. But interestingly, it is a question that um, Clan Sinclair has discussed because you could take the very basic level, which is that it, it the clan system was the fabric, a central part of the fabric of Scottish society, particularly Highland society from somewhere around about 11, 1200 through until arguably um, 1800 or thereabouts. So for a very considerable number of years, it was the absolute central organizational structure of, of much of Scottish society and much more so in the Highlands than, than perhaps in the central part of Scotland. Clan in, in, is a word taken from the old Gaelic, um, and it was had two ends on it, and it it literally means of the family, mm -hmm. and so it 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 was the description for all of those who were together. But it became um, the way in which the warring parts of different of Scotland fought each other, and uh, there were big dominant clans and smaller clans, and of course that warfare side uh, ended. Um, sadly, with probably the 1745 rebellion. Uh, it went on beyond that, but it translated also into regiments and things like that. So it's a, it, it's a vastly important part of Scotland's history. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, particularly to people who um, are looking for their descendants and who have, are, are, are part of the diaspora, 
it's a wonderful part of remembering what Scotland is about and of learning about Scotland. So in, in that sense, it's, it has a historical importance all, almost um, uh, on, it, on its own. And to those who've done a lot of uh, study into uh, clans and, and what it meant and how it fits into society, I apologise now for that incredibly rapid rush through, which could be picked apart by many historians, but, but please don't just sort of. Go with well, it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot again, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, and, and this comes down to, you, you mentioned that you, you enjoy wearing the kilt, as, as we all do. Um, I have to tell you that uh, here today it's 108 degrees Fahrenheit, which is close to, getting close up to 40 degrees centigrade. So wearing a 16-ounce uh, eight-yard kilt is not, uh, <laughs> it's not the best form of, form of attire. But I'm, I want to ask you about about tartans. Um, it's it's always a point of contention here when tartans were originated, and some people say it was in 1822 when Sir Walter Scott organised the visit of, of George the Fourth. And before that, many clans didn't have a tartan, and when they were asked for to come in their in tartan finery, they said, "Well, we don't have any." And uh, so Wilsons of Bannockburn made up their tartans for them. But there are some clans um, who say, no, 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 we, we've always had a tartan right from the inception, going back to the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries or whatever. So what, what, can you give us any sort of clarification on, on what's right and what's true? <laughs> um, probably not, but um, uh, uh, what is true is that certain there were different colorings and dyes used in different areas and it is perfectly um, clear that certain colors were worn in certain areas and there is a famous print of the Sinclair lady wearing what is now our red dress uh, tartan that, that goes back way before the 19th century um, so clearly there were recognized patterns mm -hmm. obviously the uh, arrival of um, uh, George the Fourth was a tremendous amount of excitement in Edinburgh, uh, and he decked himself out from head to foot in what we would now regard as sort of Highland apparel, um, and that gave a great spur to it. Uh, I, my father wore the kilt every day of his life um, and was a great innovator. Um, and he used to take our tartan and play with the colours. And he used to have hunters of Brora make up um, different variants. And there is a there is a kilt that I wear, uh, which is a sort of blued version of the green that I know nobody else in the world wears for the simple reason that nobody else has ever had the tartan. Um, mm. And it was made from our sheep uh, by hunters, and it was a design of my father's. You could argue. Well, that's not right because it doesn't follow the pattern. Or you could say, well, who cares? It's rather fun. It works well, and I enjoy wearing it. Um, and he did the same with a red that's um, uh, quite different to, to our dress. So I think tartan is a wonderful material, and it's a living material. And we now in Scotland put together tartans for towns, for counties. There's a Caithness tartan, which was done quite recently. And if you enjoy wearing the kilt and, and if you enjoy a set of colours, why not? And there is no doubt that, that, that different families and clans do have different tartans. And a lot of them enjoy it. But I always say, um, you know, we're all Jock Tamson's band. So at the end of the day... Um, there's a tartan for everybody. You've just got to go find it. Well, um, it's interesting because uh, you see my background here, which is the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles tartan. And uh, when we developed that in 2014, I think it was, um, I was surprised when we registered it with the National Register of Tartans to learn how many new tartans are registered every month. I mean, it, it runs into thousands. And as you sure. say, a lot of corporations that are developing their own tartans and other, and other people. Please ask this, this interesting question about uh, Southern California. So <laughs> one of the things that surprised me, and it may surprise a lot of listeners out here in Southern California, 
is that Thurso is a major destination for surfers. And what makes Thurso such an attraction for surfers? Because it, it can't be the temperature of the water. Um, it certainly isn't the temperature of the water. Most of the surfers are at the very least in a wetsuit, and most of them are actually in dry suits. Uh, but uh, right outside my window here, and if I had another virtual background, it is actually of uh, the place where people surf, which is right outside the window on the seaside of the house here. And funnily enough, it began back in the 80s with one of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother's equerries at the Castle of May, who had been brought up in Australia and was a great surfer. And he'd spotted this break and he came and surfed it. And he said, this is wonderful. And gradually over time, uh, it became known as a place to come. Uh, and it is, it's a wonderful break where the bay goes into a strange shape and it just produces a really nice wave. I mean, nothing like Hawaii or Southern California, but a really good wave. And we literally, Christmas morning, I look out and as the sleet whips past the window at 70 miles an hour, I see them bobbing in the sea and eventually getting up on their boards. Um, and it, it's tremendous. And a few years ago, we had a leg of the world um, cup for surfers, which was the O'Neill Cold Water Classic. And we had that for three or four years, I think, here. Um, and it's just, it's, it's one of the places where nature has conspired that in many conditions, the wind and the rock formations provide a, a really good break. That well, that's interesting. I thought you were going to tell us that you would you would have a competition of people surfing in kilts. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's move on to um, reality and the situation that we're all facing today, this uh, terrible COVID-19 pandemic which has severely changed lives for 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 us all and so many of us um the airlines the, the the cruise lines are you know basically shutting down the hotels shutting down restaurants are shut down and so forth i know the things are changing rapidly particularly in scotland where i understand you're opening up um a little bit more now but but how has this whole situation affected um the tourism industry in scotland it has been, without a shadow of a doubt, catastrophic. Um, in uh, When we shut down on the 16th of March or whatever it was, overnight a switch was flicked and the entire industry came to a complete halt. Uh, with the exception of some places that were offering uh, hospitality for key workers in the health service and other things like that, Every other hospitality related business, every events business, every tourist business you can think of just stopped. Um, and when you realize that that is 11% um, of Scotland's GDP, you broadly had a situation where 10% of our economy just stopped overnight. Mm. And that was a huge shock. And not only that, but the timing, because it came. Uh, uh, in March, just as we were getting to the end of the long winter season. Um, so many businesses would, were at their cash flow lowest because they were about to start kicking off again. Thankfully, both the UK government and the Scottish government put in place very quickly a, a very considerable amount of financial help. We've had a furlough scheme where the, the, the Treasury have you, I, I was able to furlough some of my employees here in Caithness and had their basically their salaries paid for almost completely by the state. Um, uh, we Small businesses had grants. Um, and w in fact, I'm part of a, a task force that is looking at how we can help businesses going forward. Uh, there have been three phases of reopening to date. Um, and we are now at the point where domestic tourism is pretty well back fully on track. And indeed, um, outside of the cities, the bed and breakfast, the camping, the country hotels are actually going flat out. Um, and a friend of mine told me the other day he's actually had his best August on record. 
uh, in his small nine bedroom hotel. So that that's really quite something. But the city centres are, are not getting anything because all of the things that people would normally come to do, like the Edinburgh Festival, like the Tattoo, uh, all of these sorts of things are not happening. So the, the city centre hotels are running at sort of still at 20% occupancy. Um, and of course, we're about to go into another winter. So it has been really a tremendous shock to the industry uh, and one which without government help, it would have not been possible to survive. And we are still going to have a difficult, people are describing it as three winters because we had winter, then we had the COVID winter and now we've got another winter coming. Yes. Um, if you look at airlines, um, I mean, I personally think this has changed air travel um, for good because I don't think we are going to be able in quick order to go back to people um, flying the way they did last year or the year before. But certain we will overcome. I am certain that, that, that um, we will be able to get to a point where we will be comp travel again. And when that happens, I am utterly confident that everything that is wonderful about Scotland will again attract people back to Scotland. So I am totally confident for the future uh, in the long term and deeply concerned for how we get there in the short term. Yes. So if somebody was planning to go to Scotland to travel once all of this is said and done, what advice would you give anyone considering that travel to Scotland? The first piece of advice I would give is leave yourself a good long time to do it because there is so much of Scotland that you need to see. The second is do lots of planning because there really is so much to Scotland and it's so different and don't try to all do it all in one go and then do it slowly spend several days in each place and really enjoy it. And I think like slow food and, sl and enjoying a slow whiskey, doing Scotland slowly is a much better way than trying to get around the whole of Scotland in two days or whatever. So do your planning, take your time, enjoy it and come back again and again and again. Well, we actually have come to the end okay. and um, we, we had targeted 30 minutes and I see we've uh, we've doubled that and uh, I apologize for that but, it, but it's been fascinating for us and thank you so much for sharing your time and um, here in Southern California it, it is now 11 o'clock but I know it's five o'clock somewhere so I would like to return your toast of good health that you made to us and Thank you so much, Lord Thurso, for being with us. Slanja. Slanja. Like a good boy scout, I came prepared. <laughs> uh, well, thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. Lord Thurso, this has been an amazing. And if there is a website or something that people can go to to plan their trip, to figure out all there is to Scotland, can you let us know? It's called www.visitscotland.com. Fantastic. So I have to go there and plan my next trip to Scotland. Absolutely. Uh, the great thing about our website is it's designed to get you to what you want to do as quickly as possible. Perfect. I'm looking forward to it. And Ian, thank you so much for being the moderator of this episode. And if there is a website you'd like to promote, like the St. Andrews Society's website? Well, that's that's part of my job, yes. The St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles is at www.standrewsla.org.org. And um, we'll also be very, very happy to see visitors on our website. As you know, we're doing a lot of virtual activities. Um, that we're forced into that situation now, but... Um, I think they're fun. Um, people are enjoying them. And I know that um, people will have a wonderful experience and enjoy this very interesting and fascinating interview with Lord Thurso. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a true pleasure. 
what a great way to spend the Friday evening. Thank you. Thank you both for being on the show today. This has been St. Andrew's Society of Los Angeles' podcast. I've been your host, Joanna Lewis, and we will see you in the next episode. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the St. Andrew's Society of Los Angeles podcast. For more information on the St. Andrew's Society of Los Angeles, visit www.standrewsla.org. And don't forget to like our Facebook page, Instagram, and YouTube channels as well. Have a great week and we'll see you next episode.